Good. Thanks a lot. And uh, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity. Thanks a lot, uh, Guy, for the invitation. And thanks a lot, everyone, for the warm evening and for your attendance. I really, really appreciate um, when I was asked to actually do this talk, I was not really sure because it's the first time I got an encounter with Ted, and thanks for introducing me to Ted. Um, and I think what was uh, particularly useful for me to start uh, looking into and start sharing is prim primarily more what I have actually come to experience and what I have come to understand with the question of um, sustainability. And given the kind of background that most uh, or the majority of the world population really are in, uh, there is two ways of understanding sustainability. Understanding it like a human crisis is one way and looking at it from a green uh, point of view. But understanding it also from an opportunity of rediscovery, an opportunity of understanding exactly what it is to be human is actually also what I have realized is the other challenge. And I think what most of my experience has really taught me about most of the issues that we are tackling about uh, sustainability revolves around those two issues. <clears throat> and then the question arises in me as to whether there is any possibility that one could really engage with sustainability in the true sense without ever encountering this question of what it really means to be human. And I think one of the biggest uh, ways or one of the ways in which this issue has been answered in the past is from a religious point of view. It has actually been answered in the sense that uh, there was a time when the answer was very clear and it was all summed up in terms of a religious response. There is a life after, and we don't have to worry about what it is that happens here. There is going to be a life after uh, whatever happens or now is over. And uh, there was a time when that solution used to fit. And but definitely we have come now through a process of enlightenment, a process of understanding things in different ways. And then we come to this point again, where we still question as to what happens if we are not on this earth. <clears throat> what happens if whatever we are doing catastrophically affects our own survival on earth? That's a big question, and I don't think there is going to be a very simple return to, uh, to religion. There isn't going to be a simple return to uh, those kind of spiritual answers. But I think there is now this, what I would really call, hands on engagement with it and trying to say it doesn't have to add. And there is the whole idea that sustainability becomes the way we then pursue existence beyond the individual existence. And we are almost taking the view that we don't have to add or we don't have to craft our own head as, uh, as a species. This challenge actually becomes even more difficult when you look at it from a developing country point of view, primarily because we are coming in at a time when a majority of the people have woken up to the concept of development and they need to see the benefits of that development. And we then come to the point where we have to involve this element of what I really now call um, the backcasting challenge. And the back, I call it the backcasting challenge because <clears throat> it has always been there, but I think we have now all been challenged to actually engage with it from a more personal level. What is so difficult about the backcasting challenge? And let me explain what it really means so that we can be all on the same page. It's this whole idea about the element of choice. If you ask me what is going to happen in the next two seconds, I can definitely tell you. I will be here, I'll be talking to you, and that's almost assured. What will happen in the next one hour? I hesitate, I don't know. Primarily because anything could happen within that interval of time. And even though 
Guy would like us to be here up to possibly mm -hmm. 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock. <laughs> there are other things that could come in between, but we know possibly within the element of one second, two seconds, we will be seated here. When you extend the time further, it becomes more difficult to really predict or say what will happen. But if you take it the other way around, when does somebody has choice? Somebody gets choice when you actually get room, time-wise in particular. And that is the, the idea about sustainable development, that it starts asking you the whole challenge of time and choice. And the question is how you connect between now when you, can, you almost don't have choice and you don't have the room to decide what it is you can do. You're almost destined to be doing what you are doing now and maybe 10 years later, and 20 years later. And in architecture, we understand this in a different way because we know we are able to perceive things in the future which we can then bring into the present and then path, uh, create the path to that uh, future. And it is that aspect about crafting the future that I think which is usually more <laughs> challenging. Because it means you must bring that kind of future that you see to the present and then craft what it is or how it is that you get to that future. And then that is where the problem comes in, the problem of choice. And immediately you bring in that element of choice. Then you start extending your time and you start giving your time, uh, giving yourself time and then seeing what is possible, what is practical and what is not practical. When I got myself into this line, I had to kind of first come to that reality after a very long process of, you know, cohabiting with what I would really call vincas of a similar uh, nature, starting with uh, people like uh, other Kosler, who actually taught me a lot about uh, systems thinking. People like uh, Buckminster Fuller, who taught me about, I talk about teaching me because they are my compatriots. I actually cohabit almost the same space with them. I don't see them as dead thinkers, in a sense. I see them as people I cohabit with. And when I read that kind of a uh, a piece of knowledge, I see it as something that I am engaging with somebody I'm talking to. So when you get engaged with those kind of uh, thinkers and they are always engaging you on a daily basis, you come now to the present where we are thinking about that aspect about um, backcasting, then you start wondering, I need time. How do you create time? So you cannot start creating changes or assuming that the change is going to happen today if you want to be the effector of that change. <clears throat> you need to give yourself the horizon. And that horizon depends on what change you want to see. If you want to see a change in the next one hour, then know what change is possible within that one hour so that you can actually then effect the transformations that are needed. If you want to see change in the next 15 years, then know what kind of change or magnitude of change is possible within that so that you can engage the intersystems that need to be engaged with in order for that change to happen. If you want change to happen in the next 30 years, 100 years, know then what kind of changes that need to happen and then start engaging the systems. And of all the concepts that I have found that has worked tremendously for me is that understanding, that level of understanding that <clears throat> actually the future is there to be made. It is not destined to happen. It is actually possible that it is, you can actually craft it. And I really want this primarily because I feel I am working in a condition where the legacy, the historical circumstances are so constraining that unless I am able to borrow time, unless I am able to craft time, I have, there is no way I can actually be able to change that. So in the process of all my activities then, what I always try to do is to say, I want this in a certain interval of time, and then from there engaging with it, and then being able to uh, engage with the processes and the systems that need to be changed 
in order for that to happen. And when you get into that, the whole process of empowerment, the whole process of being able, feeling that you are able to do it, starts becoming real in you. Which is the difference between wanting it to happen today at the when you say you would like to happen it in another five years. And then the kind of sacrifices that one needs to make then start coming in. And I think the reason why we have had this discussion over and over with the guy is that there are some times when I feel that there are things I need to stop or I need to shelf and put aside in order for me to prepare for what I would like to see five years time and 10 years time. Let me give you the example now coming more here to the kind of things that I do. I have got an architectural background, but in a sense, I don't necessarily practice architecture. I really have kind of put that aside because there are certain, you know, certain processes that I need to see happening in order for architecture to start answering to the concept of green, sustainable, and especially within the kind of environment developmental context. Say for example, the question of materials. You know, we need to get to the point where we are producing the right materials with the right prices, with the right kind of uh, technologies and the kind of reach that would make, you know, uh, products like sustainable housing or sustainable mm -hmm. buildings or sustainable cities mm -hmm. to happen. And my view, in fact, the reason why we engage a lot more with uh, people like Guy is looking for what networks are necessary for that kind of a transformation to happen. And that becomes more or less my day-to-day -day kind of uh, engagements in terms of uh, networks and in terms of processes and so forth. So that within possibly a period of five to 10 years, you are almost sure that there is something that is in place that will deliver what is actually needed. If this doesn't happen, what will happen is that we can talk about technical solutions and innovations and everything else, but there is the level at which it is most needed. Let me tell you, the possibly the greatest threat to sustainability is not about Europe, it's not about America that has reached its peak in relation to consumption. It's about those others who are aiming to reach that peak in the next 10, 15 years. And possibly there are four or five times the number of those who have reached that peak. And if that number is not supported and it is not facilitated in the right way to reach that level of consumption without necessarily leaving the, leaving the same level of destruction, if that number isn't really facilitated and supported, we are definitely not on the right track. And no matter how green Europe gets, no matter how green America gets, and no matter how green um, every, every Japan gets, if the other majority who haven't had a participation in this uh, extended uh, quality of life, if that doesn't get improved on, then we are not going to be able to get that sustainability because we are going to come with the legacy of carbon emissions. We are going to come with the legacy of uh, exploitation of resources and uh, destruction of our environmental systems. So my major concern has always been how we engage with the developmentally um, uh, demanding uh, populations both to satisfy their immediate needs today and as, at the same time ensuring that when they start reaching towards their goals in developmental needs and aspiration, that happens in a much more sustainable way. Now, why did I call this talk of mine being um, human or from human being to being human? Primarily because when you start introducing those elements in your life, when you start introducing those issues in your life, the element of choice then becomes a very critical question. And immediately when you face that question of choice, you need the values to actually judge. You need the values to determine when it is that you are making the right choice and when you are making uh, the wrong choice. 
And those are the kind of things that I think are primarily missing from most of the activities that we get engaged in. You look at our education system, it doesn't always provide for that kind of uh, embeddedness. You look at the kind of um, uh, job situations that we are in, time is not always available for the kind of judgment to happen. So we have the difficulties of reaching that level of um, that level of freedom. I would call it almost a form of a leisure in a sense, because not everybody will be able to do that. Not everybody will be able to live to that kind of uh, uh, an opportunity where they can make those kind of choices and decisions. But there must be a few of us who have that element and then can form that kind of guidance and can make that opportunity, for create that opportunity for others. When others now come through it, it will not look like a choice, it will look like something that was almost destined you know, to happen. And that really is what drives me for most of what I do, for most of the pursuits. And uh, if, we want, if you want to us to discuss what kind of activities I'm engaged in, we can do that. But the main one that I am pursuing now, and that was the last point that we talked with the guy when we talked, is the whole aspect of Africa and biofuels as an element of local economic development, starting off with the decentralized production of energy that actually empowers communities and at the same time gives them the resource that they need for their upliftment. And that is the part that I am actually engaged with right now. And we can talk about that much later. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.